welcome you all to another uh, Trilateral Commission virtual meeting. And I want to thank people in particular for joining this special meeting. We felt that the urgency of today's issue uh, really warranted a departure from our now established weekly cadence. So as you know, we're doing two calls this week, but we thought this topic of race and racism was so important and timely that gathering us um, as soon as we were able to secure our excellent speakers today was a good idea. As you're all aware that the senseless killing of, of George Floyd and so many other African Americans by police has finally pushed Americans um, into the streets in numbers that we haven't seen in decades. And have, we've seen very large groups of Americans for a long period, weeks now, protesting the systemic racism that is in many of our institutions. And while the protests, the impetus for these protests has been grim, I think it's given rise to, to hope of, of many Americans that we will finally be able to address this, this very serious weakness in our society. So I've communicated directly with the members of the North America Trilateral Commission about this issue. And I appreciate, however, that this is not just an issue for Americans, that the issue of race and the issue of these protests here in America has sparked off um, a number of other movements around the globe. So we'll look forward to hearing from people about this outside the context of America as well. So as I said, I've commented directly to our membership, but today we get to hear from three people whose expertise and dedication to these issues is really outstanding and I'm thrilled to be able to introduce you to them. In fact, I'm just going to introduce Margaret Wong, who is going to moderate our conversation and she will introduce our other two speakers. So Margaret um, is president and CEO of the Southern Poverty Law Center in Montgomery, Alabama. And she is new to that job. She took it over just as, as this uh, 10 weeks ago. So she is definitely um, getting her feet, uh, uh, well, she's already has her feet on the ground, but um, certainly it is a, a, a challenging moment to take on uh, such an organization with a, a history of really protesting racism and discrimination. Um, across the South, for sure. She has 25 years of being an advocate uh, for human rights and racial injustice. Before taking on her current position, she was executive director of Amnesty International in the United States. And there um, she was uh, an advocate and worked uh, to lead campaigns to protest the incarceration of people around the world for a variety of political and other reasons. I've personally known Margaret for 30 years and I can attest more than 30 years and I can attest that she has been um, a relentless advocate for people who are disadvantaged, oppressed, or disaffected. Um, I'm thrilled to turn this meeting over to her and thrilled also to welcome Mitch Landrew and Khalil Mohammed, um, who she will introduce in greater detail. So uh, good morning, Margaret, and thank you for joining us. Thanks so much, Megan. It's a real pleasure to be here with all of you. And I, I just wanted to note that Megan and I met as children Obviously, that, that's how we've known each other that long. But I appreciate that introduction, Megan. And it's a, a great opportunity to join all of you this morning to discuss these issues, which, as Megan has noted, have been at the forefront of our political discussion here in the United States. I'm going to start by introducing our two speakers. And I'm going to facilitate a little bit of the discussion before opening up to questions from all of you. Let me begin by introducing Khalil Mohammed who is a professor of history, race, and public policy at Harvard Kennedy School, Kennedy School, excuse me. And he's the Suzanne Young Murray Professor at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies. He's the former director of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, which is a division of the New York Public Library, the world's leading library and archive on black, global black history. And of course, he's the author of the award-winning The Condemnation of Blackness, Race, Crime, and the Making of Modern Urban America, which just had its second edition published by Harvard last year. He serves on a number of boards, including the Vera Institute of Justice, which does critically important work on criminal justice here in the United States. And his scholarship examines the broad intersections of race, democracy, inequality, and criminal justice no small order for the time that we're in. Mitch Landrew, our second speaker, is a best-selling author and of course the former mayor of the city of New Orleans. When he was sworn in as the 61st mayor of New Orleans, he inherited a city 
that was actually still recovering from Hurricane Katrina and in the midst of the BP oil spill. Under his leadership, New Orleans is widely recognized as one of the great comeback stories in the United States. And he gained prominence in particular for his decision to take down four Confederate monuments in that city. This is an issue that has come back to the forefront in our latest discussions about racism in the United States. And this, is, uh, this was a decision for Mitch that was an important one, but part of his own personal journey, confronting racism and tackling the broader history of slavery, race relations, and institutional inequalities here in the United States. He founded the E Pluribus Unum Fund. You can see his uh, branding there in the backdrop to bring people together across the American South around the issues of race and equity and economic opportunity. I'd like to start out by asking both of our colleagues if they'd like to share some opening remarks, but perhaps begin by talking a little bit about how racism is manifesting in our lives today here in the United States. And why don't we kick off with Khalil? Uh, thank you, Margaret, and uh, thank you to all of our, uh, to the commission uh, itself for having uh, myself and Mitch this morning. Uh, that's a big question, and I think uh, one of the things that is really helpful to set in context is that racism is not uh, an aberrational bug uh, in our society. Uh, the United States uh, was built under the basic understanding that there would be people who would work uh, in the field to develop the wealth of this country. And uh, you have to understand that that feature of our society, that is a hierarchical society rooted in a set of aspirational concepts that didn't apply to everybody, and we're still struggling to achieve that, means that um, racism is less about the ideas and more about these systems. So let me be even more specific. Um, the way that I think it's best to demonstrate racism today is across every sector of American society, uh, African Americans over index with the worst possible outcomes in health, in education, in income, uh, certainly the accumulation of income and wealth as assets. Uh, it is true, of course, in the criminal justice system. Generally speaking, over the past 400 years, there have been essentially two ways to explain this. Either African Americans are fundamentally inferior, make bad choices, uh, and therefore these outcomes reflect uh, the cumulative impact of all that. Or uh, they've had the worst opportunities, they've been exploited, uh, they've been terrorized, uh, and subject to various forms of austerity in their communities. Now, we don't have enough time for me to offer you the evidence to prove one side or the other, but that's the choice that Americans have been making for a long time. And so when we come to the present, when we look at the impact of COVID-19 and the pandemic itself on African-Americans, when we look at the fact that they're uh, overrepresented in uh, the low wage healthcare industry, as well as in low wage jobs that require people to keep the utilities going in this country, that requires people to uh, stock the shelves of grocery stores, then you might begin to think like, oh, the same people who a lot of people think make bad choices are also the people who we depend upon in order to keep the basics of our society going. And oh, when it comes to the various things like PPE so that people can protect themselves, well, we don't have enough for them uh, because we wanna make sure that in affluent communities, which has been proven time and time again in the last several weeks that people have what they need. The policing problem in this moment is certainly not new either. And in many ways, the story of racism that I've tried to suggest here, both past and present, reflects just the way that police essentially have to uh, do the work of containing political dissent, containing the expected outcomes when people uh, hurt themselves or hurt others by virtue of uh, the choices that they have in front of them. And the fact that our police officers uh, treat African Americans very differently than they treat white Americans and more particularly white affluent Americans means that again policing is mostly functioning as it was intended to function. I'll stop there Margaret because that's a pretty big overview. Thanks so much Khalil. Mitch I want to hear from you as well please. 
Margaret, thank you. Megan, thanks for having me. And thanks for the commission for allowing us to, uh, to be with you. Khalil, I didn't want you to stop. It was, that, was, that was really fantastic and very right. Uh, I completely uh, adopt everything that Khalil said and we'll try to amplify that uh, just a bit to the extent that I can because he is brilliant and one of our great minds uh, and hearts in America on this subject. Um, for those of you that are not from the United States and you're looking at us uh, from outside in, you know, you hear the fantastic aspirational words. Uh, we all are created equal, uh, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, in the Pledge of Allegiance, we're indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And America's that great, you know, shining city on a hill that's supposed to represent for the rest of the world the best that there is in mankind. Uh, and yet we're being forced to confront yet again. And Khalil took you through a history from the moment that we became a country, the hundred years up to when we became a country and the moment we became a country through the first uh, decades into the Civil War, uh, a really aggressive attempt to try to, to make it right for a very short period of time and then have it grabbed back uh, over time, America's story is, is one of great aspiration, but it's always one of constantly falling short. Uh, and of course, as it relates to uh, African Americans, it was never a promise that has been kept. And so the killing of, uh, that, that, that have just occurred really is a, it's a window into and a piercing uh, of a consciousness that has not penetrated this deeply in a long time. So when uh, Officer Chauvin's knee was on the neck of George Floyd, uh, if white America is listening to our African American brothers and sisters and friends, what they are saying to us is, you know, that, that feels like me on the ground and his knee on my neck. It was, it was a very personal physical killing of one person, an individual act of racism but it was also symptomatic of and symbolic of the entire history of what has happened in the country. And as you can see now, America, for a moment at least, and I hope the moment continues, it has continued longer than any other protest that we've seen at least since 1968. I was only eight years old and I don't really remember the moment, the way I'm obviously processing this as an adult, but this has now kind of woken America up to, oh, that's what you're talking about which has to be infuriating for African-Americans who have been saying, we've been saying this all along. This just didn't start with George Floyd. This didn't just start with Albert Louima. This just didn't start with Emmett Till. This traces its history all the way back to the beginning of our founding fathers who had slaves, the institution of slavery that lasted a long time, the Confederacy, which still manifests itself today with the Confederate monuments that we'll talk about in a minute, a strain of thought that runs exactly through where Khalil took us. There are two, there are two possibilities. One, African-Americans are genetically deficient and they're not equal and they're not capable, or they are and the institutions and the personal behaviors of Americans have put them in a position where their life has been valued less and they have never been given the benefit of the doubt. I agree with him. I think that's put exactly the way it should be put. Um, and the answer, although he said he doesn't have time to tell you, uh, give you all of the background behind it, but the disparate outcomes um, clearly reflect and personal reflection will clearly lead you to the conclusion that we not only have um, suffered through uh, the individual acts of racism that whites have uh, played upon African Americans, but it is in every fiber of our institutions. Now, I can tell you from the work that E Pluribus Unum has done, uh, I'm, from, I'm from New Orleans. From those of you that are not from uh, the United States of America, that's at the, at the lowest point in the South of the United States of America. And of course, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, Kentucky, Tennessee, Appalachia, and I'm sorry, Texas and Florida, although sometimes they don't self-identify as being from the South, but they are you know, have, have the deepest and the longest history. Although, as you can see now, the, the rest of the country has been in this, you know, completely difficult situation since the beginning of time as well. But we started in the South. We traveled to 33 different counties. We talked to a thousand people with half an hour, 45 minute interviews. Um, and I can confirm for you what the professor has indicated to us 
that most white people who participated in this that live in the South, their opinion, most, not all, think that African Americans are in the position that they're in because of poor life choices. That, that's generally what they think. Um, African Americans, obviously, and, and by the way, they believe that an act of uh, racism is an individual act of malice, calling somebody a bad name in a moment and treating them badly. The African American community and many other whites think completely differently that there's a complete and total institutional bias in the healthcare system, education, government, finance, et cetera, et cetera, manifest by the outcomes that Khalil told us about. Um, and that uh, the reason why African Americans are where they are is not because uh, of poor life choices. It's because of institutional pressure that we could demonstrate empirically that in my opinion is not refutable. And so what has happened in the last year, we did that about a year ago, we've now just come out with another poll. Those numbers for the first time are actually starting to move where white people are starting to wake up to, oh wait, what, what were the Tulsa riots again? Oh, wait, wait, explain to me why African-Americans dying at a, at a higher and faster clip and getting sicker. Tell me about the maternal mortality rates and they're beginning to see it, but clearly not enough. Um, and certainly what I'm saying may fall on a little, uh, somewhat of uh, concerned ears because the president of the United States, the biggest voice in the entire world, falls clearly into the category of not really understanding any of this or knowing it and completely rejecting it, or enabling at least a portion of his base to do something that is not new to anybody in America, much less those of us in the South who grew up with white politicians uh, sounding what they say with dog whistles, sending racial signals to an aggrieved minority that somehow everything is gonna be taken away from them. And that has been manifest in the face of Bull Connor, George Wallace, Jimmy Davis, and President Trump is not saying anything different than any of those people have said over the course of time. It's just much more shameful that it's actually coming from the mouth of the President of the United States. And to, to end here, uh, there are a number of other leaders of countries around the world who have picked up this nativist, racist uh, tone and language. And although the histories in other parts of the world are clearly different from the history of slavery in the United States of America, Hate is not just an American thing. It has been with us since the beginning of time. It is part and parcel of human beings trying to say that some people are better than others. But I do happen to believe that the experience of African Americans in the history of slavery is a unique experience in the history of the world. And it's one that the United States has got to grapple with, has got to deal with forthrightly, has got to acknowledge, has got to atone for, and then begin the really, that's, that's not even the hard work. The hard work is unpeeling the institutions because what we learned with Ipora Basunum is that this country is divided by design. Now, this is a very hard thing for people to accept because what they hear me saying is that every person throughout the history of the United States is, a, is an out and out racist. That is not necessarily true, but it is true that the ideas that have been based on the notion that whites somehow are better than blacks are baked into every institution and it has created um, a, a way of being that has kept America uh, much, much worse off than she would be if everybody was really accepted into that aspirational uh, vision that the Founding Fathers have created for us that we have yet, in my opinion, to achieve. Thank you. <laughs> I should say back to you, Margaret. Thank you. Margaret, you're muted. Thank you so much for that, Mitch. Khalil, I wanted to ask you a follow-up. Oh, you're muted again, Margaret. Sorry, technical difficulties, my apologies. Khalil, the, the response of many, many police forces across the country to the protests that have been happening have sparked a real public debate about the role of police in managing public dissent, in responding to protests, and just generally, of course, the, the unauthorized, and in some cases, an authorized use of force, um, and lethal force in particular. 
A big debate has emerged, and amongst those who are calling for changes, there are some who've put forward quite an extensive list of substantial reforms, some of which have been tried in many police forces across the country, and some of which go much further. On the other side is a group of people calling for the abolition of police, which has startled a lot of folks um, and raised a lot of questions about what the purpose of police is. Given what you and Mitch have just described about some of the institutionalization of, of racism, et cetera, how do you, how do you um, respond to those proposals and what do you think is going to be the future debate about policing in the country? Uh, that's a great question, Margaret. So let, let me first just set the table for, for the response to this question because I think it may not be familiar to everyone. The United States has the largest prison system in the world, bigger than any prison system ever known or measured in world history, and is bigger by expenditure and by per capita rates. So there's no other country in the world that can claim to uh, have prosecuted, convicted, caged, and or be formally supervising its citizens. There are about 2.2 million people in the United States in prison uh, today. Uh, the vast majority of whom are in state facilities, uh, about 1.4 between jails and prisons. Um, and then, I'm sorry, 1.4 in prison, and then a, another um, 500,000 in jail, and then about 200,000 in our federal system. The population is overwhelmingly either Black um, or people who identify as Brown or Latinx. Uh, that leaves about 30% of the population is white. Now, what's interesting is to get to those numbers, um, we basically have five decades for going back to the 1970s when the population in this country was just the reverse. 70% of the incarcerated population was white, 30% was black or Latino, and then very small numbers of, of Asian descended people. So that system was about 350,000 in 1970 and now 2.3 million. So a system that has grown both in sheer size, per capita rates, there used to be about 150 per 100,000 people incarcerated. Now the number is somewhere around 600 per capita uh, Americans uh, incarcerated. So a couple things. One, um, nowhere else in the world did the state, um, either at the state level or at the federal level, the government decide to invest so much in punishment when so many of those people were crying out for various other public goods or social welfare responses. So I'm not making an innocence argument, um, but I am making a policy critique. It is also true that something about 30% of that population were simply caught up in drug addiction that was uh, turned into criminal activity. So rather than treating drugs like a public health problem, which now is the new standard, uh, people were treated as if they were criminals. Now, the weight of that system fell disproportionately from 1970 to the present on people of color and more particularly black and brown people. How do you get that many people in prison? You have police officers sitting in 18,000 agencies across the country. There's no way to explain the gigantic investment in punishment without understanding a gigantic investment in policing. So the incentive structures for policing were also enhanced in such a way that every single officer in every single police force could find their own pathway to success and promotion by virtue of making being a good officer going out and arresting criminals. And I'm using air quotes for criminals. So I wanna emphasize there because that is the evidence we have for how a system functions. The United States moves towards greater austerity from the 1970, less investment in public goods, less investment in infrastructure, more divestment from welfare, uh, more precarious work. Um, everything that we know to have occurred over the last 50 years means that we took away from our public sector and gave more to police and prisons. That's just the, the way it's worked. So when we come to the question of are police officers doing the things they should be doing, it misses kind of the point. They've been doing what they were supposed to do. We have to decide as citizens of this country that we want them to do something different or less of what they've been doing. 
And that's basically the conversation that's happening at the local level that has been called defund or on one extreme abolition. Abolition of police really means that can we find another set of public goods to put in place that would promote health, welfare, and safety within communities when we know that policing often leads to very negative outcomes. Those outcomes being that police officers have a job that often sweeps up innocent people and actual innocent people, but also because we have had a kind of policing called broken windows or zero tolerance or stop and frisk policing for a long time, it means that literally people who are coming and going from work to school every day are subject to police contact. And that police contact can, can be, un, uh, be a source of trauma, of indignity, of physical assault, and other for forms of harm. Uh, so we have a lot more information about, say, for in New York City over a 10-year period, uh, sorry, 12-year period, when Michael Bloomberg, who just ran as, as the presidential the candidate on the Democratic ticket um, in the primary, he lost, and of course, Joe Biden is now representing the United States Democratic Party. Uh, he oversaw, and I want the commissioners to hear this very carefully, 4.4 million stops over a 12-year period. Of those 4.4 million stops, 80% of the people stopped were black or brown, 50% happened to be black. Of those 80% who were black and brown, or the total number of stops, 90% were people who didn't receive anything so much as a summons. And when they did find contraband, white men were twice as likely to be found with drugs or guns on, on them, even though they were way underrepresented in terms of the stops themselves. These 4.4 million people by any criminal justice standard were absolutely innocent. You have to understand that. They were innocent because they didn't even get so much as a ticket. So when we see that level of contact and occupation of communities, then of course the people don't have trust in authority. Of course people are weary of police presence and they express that when they say to police, why are you stopping me? What did I do? Now, of course, if we had different police officers and they were incentivized to behave differently, they might understand that. But we haven't had that kind of behavior, not across the board, not for all, but in too many instances. And so those police officers resent what they consider disrespect and it leads to a cycle of um, police excessive uses of force. Even though George Floyd died by Derek Chauvin, um, and we have a long list of others who died as unarmed people, the vast majority of police brutality is not the killing of unarmed people. It is the assault, it is the uh, pushing around, it is the um, making one feel like they must uh, be obedient to police authority, it is the rifling through one's pockets. And I want the mayor to talk about this a little because he did great work as mayor of New Orleans when he on his own as a new mayor took it upon himself to investigate a long trail of corruption and abuse in his own city, some of which had led to the killing of people in the midst of a horrible natural disaster uh, aided and abetted by federal neglect um, in the case of Hurricane Katrina. So when we get to the question today, it seems to me that everyone should be clear. Police officers spend too much time doing things in communities that they should never have been doing in the first place. The record of delivering safety to those communities is mixed at best. The best empirical evidence cannot attribute crime, lower crime rates strictly as a causative relationship to policing. And we could talk more during the question and answer if people wanna know more about that. Uh, we also know that when it comes to violence reduction, so the mayor obviously cared when he was mayor about killings and gun violence. The one, we have more guns in America than we have people, huge problem, makes us a huge outlier. So our politicians need to figure out how to solve that problem. But secondarily, we know that you can actually stop conflict in a community, not by swarming it with more police, but actually engaging in community-based public health interventions. We call these violence interrupters. So we have a menu of possibilities of how to move forward, but the central question that has to be answered at every local agency is, 
if we can downsize policing, because if we don't want to be the greatest punishment system the world has ever known anymore, if we actually want to be something better than that, we're going to need fewer police officers doing fewer things and focusing on just the things we really know they do very well. Wow. Can I respond to that? It's such a, that was so good, Khalil. Thank you so much. Again, I completely <laughs> adopt and agree. I'm follow, I'm, I'm work for you now. I'm gonna carry your bags. Um, his assessment is exactly correct. It is absolutely true that in America, we over-criminalize and we over-police. Let me start from the other side where Khalil ended. I think we need police officers, but I think they need to do the things that police need to do, and they need to stop doing the things that police don't need to do. Just as a politician, I don't like the words uh, abolition and defund because it gives the opposition the opportunity to scare the hell out of everybody to say that if there's a terrorist attack, you know, or if there's a mass shooting or something, there will be nobody there in those critical circumstances to protect you. That's when the police actually need it. That's what they should be trained to do. But it is absolutely true that institutionally in the United States of America, especially since 1970 forward, and of course, we didn't talk about from the beginning of time until 1970, but clearly from 1970 forward, something shifted in our thinking about, well, how we keep the streets safe. And we confused the number of police officers, the presence, and the plethora of things that we gave them the authority to do with, well, that's going to make us feel safe. All you have to do is go walk in any neighborhood, at least in, in the city that I live in, that's 65% African American, <laughs> and ask a nine-year-old, how do you feel when you see the police? They scare me. Not, I feel good, they're coming to protect me, they scare me. And that, just that one interaction just gives you a window into the institutionalization of what we have put on police officers' backs. Now, I have reason to think that on this issue of um, giving the police the the, the uh, narrower scope of authority, many police chiefs will say, you know what, we'll take that. We should never have been asked to be substance abuse counselors or mental health counselors or coaches or whatever. But because the federal government started to defund mental health, substance abuse, uh, not make investments in healthcare and education, uh, actually close a lot of the mental institutions, all of a sudden, police are being asked to do a lot of things. And the easiest thing in politics, the single easiest thing to do when you're in the legislature is to get funding for law enforcement because it's the easiest way for people to say, oh, I'll pay more if you make me feel safe. It is not unlike the same discussion that we have on the federal level, Megan, which you know better than all of us, when the president goes and says, we, are, we have potential terrorist attacks, so let's plus up the defense budget to, I don't know what it is now, $768 billion a year, which I'm told is 12 times bigger than the accumulated budgets of most of uh, the military in, in the world. And you know we have this constant debate about how much more to invest in the military uh, so that we can keep us safe, when in fact, we probably, if we were tough and smart, as opposed to just trying to be tough, could figure out how to stay as safe without spending that much money on a new F-35 jet, when maybe a lot of the leaders of the military, with, like police chiefs, would say, hey, you know what? If you invested that money on the front end, right, domestically again, in healthcare, in education, in substance abuse, in mental health, we would have a lot fewer things to respond to. And so that this idea of rethinking and re-understanding what police departments are supposed to do, keeping them focused in the areas where we need them and saying, we don't need you in these other areas because we have already resourced that, in my mind is a very uh, good uh, debate to have. In New Orleans, I have personal experience with this. When I took over the city, our police department uh, was under investigation by the Department of Justice. I invited them to come in because I wanted to see whether or not we could actually restructure, redesign, reimagine police departments. We have been under consent decree now for nine years, the entire eight years that I was mayor. And we actually went through the process of 100% changing the way we hired officers, changing the training, 
making sure that officers had body cameras if there was a, a police involved shooting, making sure the public got to see that right away. Coming up with de-escalation training that really made a lot of sense. And if you look at the New Orleans Police Department now, although it's not perfect, we went from having, I might, I'm maybe a little bit off, but like a 23% approval rating from the citizens in the neighborhood to a 75% approval rating. So in other words, through hiring collectively, training the right way, telling the officers don't arrest somebody when you pull them over for not having a driver's license, give them a summons. You can't do stop and frisk. You're there to protect and to serve and to help people feel safe. You actually can move a department if you can reimagine it from where they are to where you need them to be. Now, absent those individual uh, attempts at reforming the way a police officer works in a community every day, they're actually working, as Khalil said, within a system of laws that have generally been created by a state legislature. And then judges are governed by that. So there's three strikes you're out, mandatory sentencing, uh, bail, cash bond, all of those things create what Khalil has described to you as an incentive to incarcerate as opposed to not to arrest rather than not. And then make sure the police actually can't distinguish between an African-American individual walking down the street um, and a person who may happen to be African-American that actually committed a crime or was in the process of committing a crime and seeing every African-American like a potential criminal. That is, a, that, is a, that is an illness that has permeated all of what we have thought about in the United States of America that we have to unlearn because back to the very basic things, you learn how to hate. It's taught to you by the people who love you. That is where that comes from. It's the only place that it can come from. You gotta be taught to hate and fear, all right? Or you, you don't learn or you don't know. In other words, you are ignorant to the knowledge. Not that you're not intelligent, but that you don't know, you don't understand because you either didn't look, you didn't care, or you didn't have access to that information. In the United States of America now, as Khalil has demonstrated to us, the information is so readily available and so knowledgeable there cannot be an excuse anymore for America not confronting and dealing with this issue unless you just happen to believe that some of us are better than others. That's, that's the only, that is the only answer to your unwillingness, a person's unwillingness to now confront what it is that is so starkly and painfully in front of us at this moment. Mitch, I have to ask you one follow-up question and then we will turn to comments and questions from the group. But your work on uh, eliminating Confederate statues from New Orleans was really prescient. And it's come to the fore again recently in a lot of the discussions around how the, the history of Confederacy and obviously the institutionalization of racism is continuing to play out today. I would love to hear what you would recommend um, that governments do, particularly governments across the South, although we've seen that Confederate monuments can be found in many places across the country, not just the South. But what, what is the implication of these monuments and, and what are the important next steps for local governments to be undertaking to eliminate statues to the Confederacy? Well, I appreciate that. First of all, for those who are not from the States, um, if you don't know the history, there was a group of people who created this thing. It was really a caliphate. It was not a it was not a formally organized governmental entity and they named themselves the Confederates. The Confederacy uh, attempted to destroy the United States of America. I mean, cut it in half over the cause of slavery. There's a lot of historical arguments that have been going on and a lot of subterfuge about it. it really wasn't about slavery, but history has rendered its verdict and it clearly was. And those people that hide behind this myth that it was about the economy will readily admit that the economy was based on people being enslaved to work for free. In other words, plantations were forced labor camps. That's essentially what they were. And there were places of maim, torture, rape, and, and family separation, which is con the, the consequences of which, all of which have continued through this day. After the Civil War was over and we went into a period of reconstruction, and then the federal troops were pulled out of the South, the white people who were part of the Confederacy that were left behind, that were still the leaders of government, politics, and business, decided to send a message to African Americans that even though we the, we the Confederacy may have lost the war, we're still in power and you're not welcome. And they decided to do that by putting up these political statutes on public spaces in prominent areas to send a message 
to African Americans that you are less than and we're still in control. We have somewhat upwards of 3,000 of these. Now, I don't need to go through the entire history of lynching, but essentially the monuments were put up as people were being lynched. Both of these things were going on at one time and they were both, they were both messages and those things sit today. So in my city, the city of New Orleans, one of the great multicultural Americans who pride themselves on diversity, we were a port town. We were one of the largest cities in America when the country was founded and people you know, come to New Orleans for the, for, the, for, the, for the merging of coming together of the way the world really kind of is supposed to work, not that we don't have our own problems. But diversity for us is, is just an ethos of who we are. And when I was mayor and I was rebuilding the city, we lost 250,000 homes, hospitals were destroyed, we, we were building it back. Those monuments just started sticking out like a sore thumb saying, why, why are those things still there? You know, and as I was rebuilding the city and trying to encourage the people of the city to look forward into the future, you know, to prepare for the next hundred years, you know, you start imagining a young African-American girl who you say to her, you know, the future is yours, the, the sky is the limit. And she stands there and says, well, who is that? And why is that there? And wasn't that the man who fought the war to keep me a slave? And if they would have won, what would I be today? You, you begin to say to yourself, there is no justification for those kinds of things to be there. Now, histor some historians who, who, are, who are guilty of historical malfeasance would say you're trying to erase history. We're not trying to erase history. We're trying to get rid of false history and lies and actually open up the possibilities to be able to tell our entire story. Now, I'd say one other thing. Those pieces of metal and concrete, which are all over the place, and is places of reverence, not remembrance, not cemeteries, but they're just, they're just uh, an indication of the institutional bias and racism that Khalil, you know, so eloquently told us about today. And if you just take them down, which you should do, and you don't dig deeper into what they represent, which is a power structure that has created these biases, then we will have made a little bit of progress, but you really wouldn't have got into the meat of what it is that we're talking about. So the first order of business is if those things are in public spaces, if taxpayers are paying for them, they ought to be taken down, period. What the, what the community puts back there, I would just encourage every community to think about something that brings them together that lifts them up. And then finally say, that's just the first tiny step. If they were there, that means that there's something else deeper in us, in our community, in our institutions, in our schools, in the way we redistrict, in the way that we suppress votes, in the way that we deny healthcare, deny education, how we over incarcerate, how we over police, that has, that has made us less of who we should be. And the country, this is what's so exciting about this particular moment, the country could be so much better. I mean, I know we all love the United States of America, but what a patriot is, is being questioned right now. I would say that a patriot is somebody who does their duty and redresses their grievances against the government because you think that you can make it better. That's why, that's what a patriot is from my perspective. And I think we need to reclaim that word. I think that we, we need to reclaim what it is to be an American. I think we need to fight for what our vision of America is. And the, and the root of it is, if you don't get rid of racism, if you don't go through this, and I mean lacerate it, then we will never heal as a country and never be anywhere close to as powerful and as wonderful and as joyful as we profess that we want to be. Thank you so much, Mitch. Now I have a short list of folks that I'm gonna call upon. We're gonna start off with Roberto. And then uh, I also saw a question from Eli Lenars uh, and Ichiro Fujisaka. If you have a question as well, could you raise your hands uh, using the, the reaction uh, at the bottom of your screens? Or please use the chat box to add your question. Roberto, over to you, please. Thank you very much. This was much more of a learning experience for me than anything, even though I had uh, myself lived in the United States. On the one hand, I could come up with a conclusion that says I didn't realize that the United States was so fundamentally broken. On the other hand, I can come up with a conclusion that it's a younger country than I had expected because the issue of racism doesn't really come to the fore in this part of the world, maybe because of centuries of blending of races and so forth that have resulted in many countries here that have far more uh, homogeneity in population than the United States. 
the United States, on the other hand, appears to have embarked on a wonderful uh, experiment, so to speak, of uh, diversity and multiculturalism. And uh, its evolution, I guess, remains to be seen. And to some extent, it's exciting. To some extent, it's concerning because certain elements of it are going in directions that we would find a little bit confusing. From an Asian perspective, ideas of patriotism, uh, responsibility to, to the community rather than emphasis on individualism. Uh, and of course, um, we are a little surprised about uh, the, in a sense, uh, review of uh, history. So wondering where this may all proceed in terms of how do you end up with a united country with all these diversity issues that you have to face. The other, the other comment I had was that uh, the police is one subset of what you seem to have been describing as systemic. And when it becomes systemic, it, it's almost like something in the genes. And it seems to be the, the white population having this uh, mindset, as, as you seem to have been describing, as against the um, non-white population, particularly the black population. And there seems to be a feeling of, in a sense, atonement that, uh, that, uh, that, that is manifest in, uh, in uh, bringing down symbols and pieces of history and so forth that may be leading to this mindset. The question in my mind is, having come from the part of the world where colonialism was rampant, and knowing that slavery, uh, as it was manifest in the United States, was not the beginning of all this um, historic, you might say, oppression of other peoples, how far do you think the atonement of the white population should go? Because uh, in Africa, there was genocide, there was rape, there was the division of the entire continent in, 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 a, in a manner that had to do with who gets which natural resource rather than what is beneficial to the people. And even if I go to the United States, yes, I can understand the, uh, the, the angst of the black community, but uh, the wipeout of the original American Indian community and their having to be locked up in a reservation doesn't smack again of uh, something that is kosher and maybe the whole thing may require a, a deeper uh, review all the way down, not just the United States, but all those who had practiced this in one way or another in the pursuit of Western civilization. Uh, that, that, is, that is my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll just make a very quick uh, uh, response. I, I think, um, Roberto, that was really um, powerful reflection on what you heard here today and your own experiences and thinking about how the U.S. is on a uh, sort of where is it in its own story. <laughs> and I think the shortest version of response is that we haven't even begun to deal formally with uh, the history of this country because it's only since the 1960s that we didn't have the legal infrastructure of white supremacy. And I use that word because everything about the United States in explicit form was about privileging white people to have access to everything, period. And the vast majority of black people were subject to second class citizenship and then by custom in many other parts of the country were restricted. Federal government was not protecting access to home ownership. We had segregated schools that were black people paid the same taxes as their white neighbors, but they got inferior uh, access to schools. So, so Roberto's point about it's a young country, he's right. It, it's only been possible to kind of deal with that history since the 1960s. And just to say um, that what could we have expected in that moment? Well, we went in the direction of being the most punitive country in the world, uh, starting in, in the 1970s. And then the second thing is we bypassed any formal commitment to re-education. So every post-conflict society in the world according to UN standards and US advice <laughs> is for them 
to engage in some kind of post-conflict re-education. I've been spending some time in Germany. I've been to Berlin twice. I was in Munich in October. Munich just opened a museum on the site of where the Nazi party first began, the physical structure of the buildings of the Nazi party, the promenade where it first organized, and the Bavarian Academy, which is the home of the American Academy that was part of the re-education campaign for denazification beginning in 1945. There's no denazification of, of white supremacy in the United States of America. It's never happened. We still have textbooks that teach that slavery was this like little blip in history that was a, a mistake and those people were bad and we've moved on from there. So Roberto, you're right, we're young. We need to re-educate the entire society. We need a new narrative of what makes America the country that it has become. Uh, can I, may I pipe in here? EPU, uh, that's one of the reasons why I founded E Pluribus Unum. Um, because I wanted to try to help listen, to understand, and to try to figure out a way to make a little dent in how the United States of America could acknowledge what happened in the past, to say, I'm sorry, to say that we recognize that that was wrong, we want to get better, which is a, takes a long time, and then what are we going to do going forward? We have never had like Germany or South Africa, a, a, a honest conversation, much less a process to get people to move from where we are to where we need to be. The George Floyd killing and the, and the protests that have followed give you a glimmer of hope that maybe, maybe America is finally waking up to the willingness and the ability. And now I'm speaking about white America. I'm not talking to African Americans. I'm not culturally competent to do that, but I am culturally competent to be a white man from the South. And as you think in a democracy about how you get people to peacefully vote, to change the laws, who do we elect as the sheriff? Who do we elect as the DA? Who do we elect as the mayor? Who is the governor? Who's the president of the United States? Who is in Congress and the Senate? And demand that we actually do what Khalil has so aptly described as move from a system of systemic bias into an open system that entire process has to be identified. Now, you can call it a truth and reconciliation movement. You can call it a lots of things, but it is a way to get from where we are to where we need to be. And we as a country, I would agree, this very young country has got to do that to get to wherever it is that we're going. Because I think what's happening now is a lot of Americans are saying, you know what, full stop. We're not going to keep going. We have got to deal with this issue. And unless and until we do, unless until we make different choices that we made in 1960 and in 1970 that took us in the wrong direction, there's good reason to believe that we're gonna to continue to have the kind of alienation that we have. And so this idea that, you, that white people used to hear as a threat, no justice, no peace, is actually just a statement of fact. It is just a statement of humankind where people do not feel like they're being justly treated and they're not giving that when they're not given or seated or being able to, to, to seize their liberties and their freedom, then you have alienation. And that alienation manifests itself in the, all of the different things that we talked about today. So, you know, our country professes to be one of liberty and justice for all. We, we've, we've fallen short on the justice side. Um, and we've used the liberty piece to actually take us in a direction of overburdening, you know, um, folks that quote unquote, don't look like us. And I'm using air quotes, as Khalil said. And so I hope that this country goes through a, a period, a, a deep, uh, thoughtful period of truth and reconciliation. And of course, that how long that takes and how painful that is will depend on our willingness to acknowledge, to say I'm sorry, and to come to a repairing of the damage that was done so that we can move to where we all say we want to be. Mitch, I'm wondering if you might have an extra 10 minutes because sure. I have offered to let us go a little bit over. I do. So, wonderful. So if I could do this, if I could invite Eli, Ichiro, and Jean-Claude to ask their questions, and then I'll come back to each of you for some responses and final remarks. Sure. So let's go first to Eli. Sir, you had a question. Yeah, thank you, Margaret. Um, <clears throat> having lived in the U.S., um, uh, both East Coast in the South as a student, later as a professional, 
uh, in an inner city, suburban. Uh, I, I've tried to understand uh, the very issue you have been, we have been discussing of the last hour or so. And, and Roberto's questions and the response to that, I think, have, have given me some building blocks. Um, my, my family and I, um, when we left the U.S. the last time round, we lived in the, in, in, in the South, and, and this is a very crude and rude uh, way of saying it, but I don't know how to say it differently. We, we, we came a little bit to the conclusion, the Civil War is not done. That, that's okay. With that mindset, that's right. we left. And, and I know it's crude and rude, but there's no other way for me of saying it. Um, now, we in Europe are dealing with our set of issues, related issues. It's more immigration related. Um, and I think it's one of the key challenges we have in Europe to deal with this uh, in the right way. So any counsel from people from North America who are dealing with it as we speak, I think could be very useful to make certain we don't make the mistakes we could prevent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ichiro, I'm going to you next. And you're on mute, sir. Am I? Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, uh, thank you very much. I have a great respect for American experiment. Uh, uh, and uh, however, that Japan has gone through uh, fighting against racism within Japan and internationally. So I also understand the feeling of uh, some people in the United States who says enough is enough. But there should be a balance as well. And uh, I'm a bit appalled by the call for uh, police defunding. And as Mayor Landrieu said, uh, uh, that would uh, sort of uh, uh, be a little dangerous as well. Uh, because I think average American, I don't know, I'm in Japan and I, I don't know the American situation, wants a sort of balanced reform. And from that point of view, now my question is very direct. Uh, I think uh, pushing envelope is a little too uh, dangerous, but uh, now uh, Senator Klobuchar said, uh, next VP should be woman of color and she stepped down. Now people are think, uh, saying, Senator Kamala Harris, uh, Congresswoman uh, Val Deming or Stacey Abrams, so those people, and isn't, is that, isn't that narrowing the selection a little too much. Uh, it's very different from President Obama because he won the primary. Second, the next VP could become uh, your president uh, in a few years time as well, uh, very uh, possibly. In that case, I'm a bit concerned. How would average Americans be thinking about this situation? It's a, I'm sorry, it's not diplomatic, very direct question. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, Ichiro. And Jean-Claude, to you, sir. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Thank you to you, Margaret, and to Caril and Mitch. It was absolutely fascinating. Uh, I have one remark and one question. Remark, the European Parliament, a few half days ago, has voted, declared Black Lives Matter in the European Parliament. The vote is in favor by 493 MPs against 104 and 67 abstained. So you see the echo of what's happening in the US is gigantic. Not surprisingly, because of the influence of the US, of course, because of the friendship between Europe and the US, because UK, France, uh, Netherlands, uh, Belgium were colonial countries. So we have also the, the past, which is there for us too, of course, and of course, you have also immigration, as said Eli. So all this might explain why there is a formidable echo of what's going on in the US, in Europe. Now, my question, uh, the, the name of uh, President Obama was uh, pronounced only very recently, <laughs> a few minutes ago. Uh, for the rest of the conversation, he was not too much mentioned. For me, it was the proof that the US was not racist 
because it would be unthinkable in a racist country uh, not to, uh, to, to have a black president, not only winning the primaries, as was just said a moment ago, but also being elected and being re-elected. So how, could you comment on that? Uh, where am I wrong, plain wrong myself, in being too flattering for the US? Thank you so much for all of those questions and comments. Khalil, let me turn first to you. Yeah, so I'll start with the last question, um, but I'll try to answer them uh, as one uh, collective response. Um, so you have to think of Barack Obama as the best of the best of American exceptionalism. So as, as Mitch so um, well articulated, this tradition of liberty and justice Obama represents that justice quotient um, that reached its peak in the half century since the 1960s. Um, so as much as we have talked about what's wrong and the way this, these systems have functioned, there have always been these uh, threads of, of hope, of possibility, of success, of outcomes. Um, I live a very comfortable life, uh, which is apparent here, we don't, all black people are not suffering um, in their daily lives from the worst possible outcomes in this society. But if we look at 30,000 feet, if we look across time and we look at the empirical evidence, um, my life is exceptional in this country, as well as Obama's life was exceptional. And white Americans, what makes white Americans exceptional is that they've had the ability to embrace exceptionalism in individual form. Um, quick example, in the 1940s, the State Department started to send out black exceptions, Duke Ellington, uh, Dizzy Gillespie, other cultural ambassadors to show the world that America was an open, tolerant society. But it was precisely those exceptional people, um, Louis Armstrong also, um, that actually proved the rule of a society steeped in segregation that South Africa was modeling itself after, that the Germans had already been in conversation with early 20th century racist thinkers in the United States about how they could uh, develop their own system of racism. So two things can be going on at once to go to Jean-Claude's point. So perhaps in other parts of the world, those countries are not ready for someone of immigrant descent to represent the state, um, as has been true in the United States. But we have used the appearance of black exceptionalism to try to dissuade others from seeing the truth of our systems of racism. And, and this has been statecraft going on for 70 years. I am at the Harvard Kennedy School. The Harvard Kennedy School has had three black tenure professors. I'm the third um, in history. And generally they've worked alone. So in a country steeped in race and racism, one of the leading world uh, policy schools has made a choice intentionally to not teach about race and racism and only have one black person in any senior authority position um, to educate people. So that's fascinating. Okay, finally. Um, so Obama was the best of what we could produce, but Obama also failed to challenge America in a way that would redress our past. And so Black Lives Matter started on Obama's watch. The era of these, this movement that we're seeing right now started under President Obama's watch, and he did not lead, he followed the path of activists. So there's always a chance, as Mitch might note, for politicians to catch up and get in front of the crowd. Um, and so Obama tried to do that in his last term. Kudos to him. Finally, I will say the immigration problem. If America has a racism problem post-1960s, Europe has its own xenophobic problem post-colonialism. And so all of the wealthiest countries in the world extracted as much as they could in a scramble of resources in South America, as well as in Africa and in South Asia. Um, and then when the business of colonialism came to an end, wanted to go back to their homogenous countries. And yet people are saying, no, you've taken from us, you've destroyed our communities. Yes, we are politically in charge of our countries, but we are beholden by debt and by world and global finance, which is a profoundly stratified, globally unequal society. So either you take us as people, we're coming to your home, <laughs> or you redistribute 
global well so that we can prosper in our own communities. That's it. Finally, Sarah Palin was the uh, choice of John McCain. Um, the, the John McCain was, ran against Obama, as you know. Um, I, I don't have a lot of concern about uh, by, particularly Biden's choices. I think all those women are incredible. But the notion that somehow Biden is doing something that presidential front runners haven't done across time, which is to cultivate uh, a VP selection based on a political strategy uh, is just simply not a new thing. Um, and Sarah Palin was profoundly unqualified for that role had something happened to John McCain if he had won office. Thank you so much, Khalil. Mitch? I just keep wanting to listen to Khalil for the rest of the day. That's all good stuff. Uh, I'll, let me start where he ended on the, on the VP thing. Um, Every one of those women that are being considered right now is eminently qualified to be the vice president of the United States on their own right without any political analysis thereof, to the extent that we need one. Uh, Khalil pointed out Sarah Palin. I would remind people that George Bush, first George Bush president, picked Dan Quayle, who was a little known, little experienced, you know, guy who became the vice president of the United States. And of course, uh, you know, we always go through these parlor games. Essentially, though, Donald Trump, who became the president of the United States, had no experience at all. And so each one of these women uh, in, in their life, in their academic, you know, backgrounds, in the experience that they have, you know, are plenty capable of being the vice president of the United States. And, it, you know, should history call them, uh, could step into the presidency and would exercise good judgment uh, and use their experience to make good decisions. So I'm not overly concerned about that. Vice President Biden's doing what every presidential candidate's doing. He's thinking about three things. Who can help me get elected? Who do I get along with it that it reflects my value? And who can help me win? Those are really the three things that every candidate's got to think about. And they make a calculation that they think will help. Sarah Palin was a, uh, was a Hail Mary pass by John McCain that actually uh, was very dangerous and did not work out well for him. And so vetting processes are really important. So that's my comment on that. Secondly, uh, to, to the, one of the first questions, he, racism is not um, an American creation. Um, we clearly have it here, uh, but of course, all across the country, whether it's uh, this sense of otherness, of other people thinking they're better than other people or just not feeling comfortable with people that don't look like them, that all flow from the same, it's the fruit of the same poisonous tree of hate that has been with us since the story of Cain and Abel. Um, I happen to think the American experience of slavery is unique and different um, in, in scope and scale that America has to deal with. And I do think that it's part of our bone marrow that we have to extricate. It's like cancer. Um, and you know, if, if anybody who's had a, the awful experience of having cancer in their family, the treatment is chemotherapy, it is awful. Uh, but it kills the cells in the body so that it can live again. It is, it is an intentionally painful experience so that you can live, uh, hopefully, um, for a very long period of time. And I think the United States of America, as wonderful as it is, as as many opportunities as it gives, there is an underbelly um, that actually holds uh, the entire country down by having, forgive the pun, but the, the, the foot on the neck of so many African Americans, and I want to end with this because Khalil himself makes the point, his personage and his vision. Harvard University, the most outstanding university in the country, arguably, um, he's the third full African American professor. And this is a school that has always held itself out as being a bastion of the liberal ideas of justice and freedom and liberty. Um, and so I think that speaks for itself. I think every institution now wants to try to do better. I think we're late to the game, but hearts and minds can be changed. But I just wanna, I wanna end with, with a couple things. First of all, Wenton Marcellus, one of the great musicians of all time, um, who, was, who was, uh, knows as much about Louis Armstrong as anybody, said that Louis Armstrong left the city of New Orleans because of those Confederate monuments, because those monuments communicated to him that, that he was not welcome in his hometown. And I have had many people tell me, I don't feel welcome, so I'm going someplace else. So think about all the things the South has lost. When we sent 4 million people out of the South, made them refugees in their own hometown, and they took intellectual capital, raw talent, raw material, and went someplace else. How much did we in the South, all of us, white people, black people, brown people lose because we didn't recognize the, the, the talent? And finally, 
On the issue of exceptionalism, I would ask Khalil this. He knows the answer to this question already, and forgive me for being so personal. But as brilliant as he is, and as smart as he is, he will tell you that there were 10 kids in his neighborhood that he grew up in without was as smart and as fast as he was, who got left behind and eaten up by the system. So how many more Khalils are out there? How many more, I asked this to Jasmine Ward, who's one of our great African-American Southern writers who left you know, the bowels of Mississippi to go get educated. How many more of there are you? And of course the answer is a huge amount. I mean, that, it's just, we don't really understand how much that we have lost and are left behind. So yes, it's a matter of justice and of fairness and of liberty, but it's also a matter of just complete and total waste and abandonment of human beings that of their own right should have their freedom, but also are not in a position to give back because we haven't given them the tools that they needed. And we haven't given them, quote unquote, what white people, people like me, privilege have lived with, which is the benefit of the doubt all the time. You know somebody, so you get the interview. Your daddy knows somebody, so you get the bank loan. When you get stopped by the police, the police know your mom and daddy, so they'll send you home so your mom and daddy can take care of that. And, and those kinds of things where you can get a mortgage and you can get an education, help you build generational wealth, all of the other stuff stops you from building generational wealth, stops you from getting an education, stops you from lifting up your family. And as a consequence, America every day, as forward as she goes, gets diminished. She moves forward, she gets diminished. She moves forward, she gets diminished. It has gotten to the point now where hopefully it's become obvious to the people of the United States of America that if we're going to be who we say we are, if we're going to live in the truth and the values that we project to the rest of the world, we have to change. And as a young country, I'm hopeful that number one, we'll recognize how young we are, but how really critically important it is that as we prepare for the next 300 years, this is an essential component and a building block of what it means to be a great democracy. Gentlemen, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been incredibly enlightening, even for me. And I'm really glad, Megan, that you brought us all together. I'm handing back over to you now, Megan. Thanks. Thank you, Margaret. Um, and let me just close out and thank people for staying um, the extra minutes, which were very well spent. I think this has been a, a very sobering and even probably to many a shocking conversation, an excellent conversation on, on all counts. And I, I think I'm not the only one probably on this call or in this meeting who feels called to redouble um, our efforts to look at our own environments to figure out how we can do better. Um, and, and I would say that I'd like to leave on a note of optimism that we've heard from all of our speakers that we are, although a very flawed country, at a moment, hopefully, of real inflection. Khalil mentioned that it's only since the 1960s that we've gotten rid of the legal structure of white supremacy. And now we have the challenge of getting rid of the other remnants of it, the cultural remnants. And I'll just end by saying you know, that Mitch said at the beginning, we are a country of aspirations that often fall short. I think that will continue to be true, but there really is, I wanna assure people as our speakers have, that there's a real feeling this is a different moment. And I very much hope that that proves true. And this proves to be a moment as seminal in American history as the 60s are um, for us going those extra much, much, much needed steps. This has been a fabulous conversation. I'm so grateful to Margaret Khalil and Mitch for joining us. Um, I know that uh, many of our members will watch this online. I hope people who were participating live will be able to encourage people who didn't get a chance to join us live to watch it online because it has been so powerful. Um, thank you all for joining us and thanks to everyone for contributing also an international perspective. And I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Have a great- Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Thank, thank you, Margaret. Thank, thank you. Bye.